Rob Berthoff here. Let's talk about the greatest court case of all time, specifically the first court case. This is a core belief of the ST Church, and it's that all humanity is now involved in a great controversy between Christ and Satan regarding the character of God, his law, his sovereignty of the universe. The great controversy will end when the God of love is vindicated. Remember, the theme of the great controversy is the vindication of the Father and proving that he is love. But if we ask most Adventists how real the great controversy is, there's some are on a spectrum. Some look through their earthly eyes and think it's all just a big metaphor. Others accept that there are things that we cannot see, but don't think much more than that. But we should not be fixing our eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen, because what is seen is only temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. If we could only see through our spiritual eyes, we would see that we are on the main stage. All of creation is watching how the great controversy is playing out here on earth. Inspiration tells us that our little world is a lesson book to the universe. So how is it that we're so blinded by what's around us? We need to exercise our spiritual eyes more, or we'll become focused only on self. There are many basic Bible questions which remain answered when looking only through earthly eyes. To get answers to these questions, we need to rewind back before the earth was created. All was perfect in harmony with the Creator's will. The love of God was supreme, which brought total love for one another. It was God's desire that all experience and share love. We can learn about a lot about who God is based on how He created love. And I went into this in a different course earlier, but the formula starts with one another, other centeredness. There's no fear, and we have the freedom of free will. But this freedom of free will was actually perverted. Before the fall, Lucifer was one of the covering cherubs, holy and undefiled. And it's, we read that evil originated with Lucifer, who rebelled against the movement, the government of God. Lucifer was the light bearer who was next to Jesus in power and majesty. We learn that Lucifer thought too highly of himself. He started to imagine himself more than he was. He was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. He was not content with being the highest of the angels. He wanted to exalt himself to be like God. When Lucifer found out that there was plans to create humans, he thought he should have been part of the planning, and it was filled with envy and jealousy and hatred. Before humans were created, the topic of creation of humans was brought up in the councils of heaven. And here, Lucifer requested that he should be made prince to govern the new world. But the request was denied. The king of the universe summoned the heavenly courts before him. And in that presence, he may make known the true position of the son. Before the assembled inhabitants of heaven, the father declared that none but Christ, the only begotten of God, could fully enter into his purposes and to him he was committed to execute the mighty counsels of his will. And while all the angels bowed to Jesus and accepted them as their ruler, Satan became envious. Concealing his real purposes, he assembled the angelic host, introduced the subject which was himself, the first lie that was going forward, that all the precious liberty the angels had enjoyed was at an end, for not, had not a ruler been appointed over them? And a call to arms was issued that he should no longer submit to the invasion of his rights. Lucifer insinuated that God was not love and could not be trusted. This was a lesson of how dangerous it is when we gossip. He promised them a new government in which all would be free. And he started to gain sympathy. What's important to note is that this is not an outright war. It started with gossip. Lucifer had been the covering cherub, the highest of all created beings. He had been foremost in revealing God's purpose to the universe. After he had sinned, his power to deceive was even more deceptive, and his unveiling of his character was more difficult because of the exalted position he held with the Father. God tried many times to bring Lucifer back to repentance and back in line, but he stubbornly maintained his position. A number of the angels were seduced by Satan's lies. What we start to see is that that number crept up. In fact, it actually got to a point where it reached critical mass. Nearly one half of the angels started to question 
if God was love and if his kingdom was just. Now, this is where we pause because this is where really the story essentially starts. So if we rewind a little bit, just to recap, what was the formula that God used to decide on what was love? It started off with unacenteredness. And now what we see is that this is under attack. Love requires other beings to experience it, but his cancer of selfishness is spreading rapidly. It's now at 50%. And if the beings are not checked, it could completely take over. And if it were to reach past 50, you could see how fast it could potentially go to 100. Other centeredness would no longer be viable. And while God is a God of love and will always exist, his ability to share love was in jeopardy. Now, God could have destroyed Satan and his sympathizers, but he chose not to do so. It would have been ultimately putting a doubt in the goodness of God had he remained in their minds. We read here, had Satan and his host then perished, a doubt of God's goodness would have remained in their minds as evil seed to produce its deadly fruit of sin. So what... What we're saying here is that if God immediately wiped them out, right? he could have eliminated the rebellion, just, just cut out the cancer. But then what would happen? It would have caused fear. And those who remained would have a little doubt always in their mind. And that love would cease to exist. Now, God could have created us without free will in the first place. right? He could have created us these little, these little dolls, these little machines, right? Uh, as AI chatbots, right? But that's not God's plan for what he desires for love. And so if had he created us without free will, he would not be able to experience the love that he's looking to experience, the love that is mature love. At this point, from our humanly perspective, it would seem that love is doomed. But God had already developed a backup plan just in case this rebellion started. Now, just to put in perspective, Lucifer had already confused almost half the population. The cancer of his lies was quickly spreading, and those who were deceived could not even see it. They needed to see him unmasked in order for God to be vindicated. But how? This would need to happen before critical mass was reached and before the cancer spread so quickly that it consumed everything. It needed to happen in a very short amount of time. But how do you demonstrate that? So God called everyone together. We see that God intervened and asked everyone, would they be willing to wait a few days before making up their mind? And they all agreed. And so the court was assembled. And called into session, the jury seated around the throne. The prosecutor, the defendant, the jury, they were all there. Now imagine, you know, let's kind of like use our spiritual eyes, you know, using our, our earthly eyes to understand what a courtroom looks like. Let's now kind of use our spiritual eyes and figure out what this looked like. I have a course, uh, course on the Sea of Glass where I detail this in much more detail. But just as a high-level uh, recap, right, we have the defendant. And this is God, but also God's law is on trial. So it's God's character, right? And he is the defendant. We see Lucifer, the prosecutor, making allegations that God's law cannot be kept, that God is actually not even love. And around the, thr the, the throne, we see four beasts. They're full of eyes. These are the court reporters. They have a role to play. They're the bailiff. So they're holding back the winds of strife. Above their heads, we read that there is a, a veil, right? It's a sea of glass. The same way the veil of the most holy place protects those from being consumed by God's brightness. I have a different court case. I have a whole different case, uh, uh, course on that. If we zoom out a little bit, we'll see that the host of heaven is in attendance of this great court case. And ultimately, they're the jury. In Kings and Chronicles, we see that all of the host of heaven. In fact, all of the host of heaven has assembled for one week. They've all paused what they're doing and everyone is together for this one week in time. And the court case is opened. 
the court is, 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 is assembled. And the first court case on the docket, case number one, is Lucifer versus the government of God. This is the great controversy. This prosecutor, Lucifer Morningstar, a.k.a. Satan, right, challenges the legitimacy and fairness of God's government, questioning the elevation of Christ, supreme authority, right, as well as saying that they will do a reform system based on his ways, based on Lucifer's ways. And this test, right, this case tests whether God's rule is just and whether his authority should be accepted by all created beings. It ultimately gets the heart of, is God love? And so with this, what's interesting is that we now start to see the docket, right? There's a motion to challenge Christ's authority, a request of full disclosure of these council meetings, a petition for equal representation and heavenly governance, actually to create their own governance, an objection to unilateral decision-making by the Most High, and a motion to stay of execution on Christ's commands, a notice of intent to establish a new order, to re-ultimately do, right, to, to reform the kingdom of God. And we find that this was given four days. It was decided that time must be given to Satan to develop the principles of the government for 4,000 years. And you say, well, Rob, you just said four days. Why is that? Well, the jury could not see that there had tricks being played on them. They needed to see it. Lucifer's lies played out with someone else. And so it needed to be done in a fast forward. Follow with me here. In Psalms, we read, For a thousand years in thy sight is but yesterday. So David says that one day is like a thousand years. But that's just once. But he says it again. He says, A day in thy courts is better than a thousand, he says. Now, is this saying that a day to God is like a thousand years to man? Well, 2 Peter 3.8 is, gives us an answer. It states emphatically that we are not to be ignorant of this one thing, that a day of the Lord is a thousand years on earth. And now, I've given this presentation, and I always have the late adopters coming up to me and saying, well, Rob, 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 that uh, as a thousand years, that's not literal. But the word used as is hos, translating from the Hebrew, as long as. Right? One day to God is as long as a thousand years to us. It's not a metaphor. It's described as an equivalency. And so when we look at the three times this was mentioned, right, in Psalms twice and in Peter, and 2 Corinthians tells us in the mouth of two or three, everything should be established. So this must be significant. And that all scripture is profitable and for instruction, so it must have a meaning. And so when I read, do not be ignorant, of this one thing. This is the key that helps us understand the court case that's happening, that one day in the court case above is a thousand years playing out here on earth. Now, this is not an isolated thing. It's not something I've even made up. We actually find out that the Adventist pioneers, if you've heard a man named J.N. Andrews, the first Advent missionary, right, the one of the original Advent pioneers, he wrote, and was not rebuked in this, he wrote, we, the Adventist pioneers, think that God chose a period of six days such are known to man for the work of creation in order to represent to man that in six days of a thousand years or each um, known to God would accomplish the period of assignment before the judgment of man. So the Adventist pioneers all clearly understand, and if you watch my, um, watch my course on the great week of time, and, or Pattern Matching Time, I think is the title of it. If you watch that, I actually explained through Rabbi Elias, Rabbi Kitna, everybody understood this principle. It's just that we've forgotten it, clearly. But ultimately, there is a cosmic week happening above us, 2,000 years before the law, 2,000 years with the law, 2,000 years since the Christ. And what's interesting is that this six-day court yet case, the 6,000 years permitted for this all to play out. And ultimately, at the end of this, they'll answer the question, right? why does God allow bad things to happen? He's allowing a period in time for him not to, for, for him to allow his, f the free will he's given us to be ultimately mm, perverted. 
And so God is not intervening on horrible things that are happening because it needs to show what is actually happening. Lucifer's kingdom needs to play out. And so when someone asks you, why does God allow bad things to happen? The answer is because we're in a court case and we need to see a demonstration of a government. Remember that our little world is the lesson book of the universe. And this little world has been a lesson book for almost 6,000 years. The Bible tells us the same thing in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, that we are made a theater to angels. So when you watch a movie in a theater, it gives the whole story in a short period of time. And that's what's happening now. We are moving at a thousand times speed inside of this and outside the jury is operating in a normal time. And they're able to watch in fast forward in what Lucifer's kingdom actually would look like. And so when we start understanding this, day one of the court case, right? Lucifer, he gives this, you know, his, his opening argument that God is not fair, right? And that God's law cannot be kept. And what's God's response? He can't just, he, he doesn't just defend himself. No, 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 I promise. No, no, he doesn't say anything. In fact, he just opens up a vortex right there in the sea of glass. And in that, Christ goes into this container that was prepared since the beginning of time. And in this container, this is where Christ actually creates. And Christ does this in less than two seconds because he's inside the container. And so the six days that he created the, heaven, the, the, the entire earth as well as the firmament, which is the, the second heaven. So the first and second heaven uh, were created in that two seconds of the jury time. And then the jury sees all this and the father says, okay, I can't disprove what you said, but why don't you make your court case, why don't you make that same case again? Tell Adam and Eve exactly what you're telling us up here, that half of us are already believing. Go tell them what you told us. And I think it's interesting that he goes down in in his sneaky ways. He says, oh, God is oppressive. You could be God. And what the court case above, what everyone else above is like, wow, he said that to us. Is he manipulating us like he's manipulating them? And within less than an hour of time, man fell. We know the story that Eve had sinned. Eve had, had, had taken that, but God had warned Adam. God had warned him from heaven that of the tree of knowledge and good and evil, thou shalt not eat for the day thou eatest. You will surely die. So God from heaven told Adam that that very day he would die. But how long did Adam live? Did Adam die that day? In earthly terms, no. In earthly terms, he lived, how long? 930 years. So, is God a liar? Or did God say from his time, because one day in heaven is a thousand days on, a thousand days on earth? So, God said from heaven, the day you eat, you will die. And Adam died that very day. Now, we know the story how this plays out, right? Adam and, and Eve, they have multiple sons. And of these sons, the first two, you know, have this show off, right? They, they get to a point where, where, Cain, or where Cain decides that he wants to worship his own way, disobey God's ways. And, but Abel, he continually follows God's way of doing things. And this is where the first ultimately led to the first death. When Abel's worship was accepted and Cain's self his own way of worship was, dis was, was not accepted, right? The first death ever. In, the, in, in a time frame of about two hours, in the court case above, the first death happens. This is completely uh, new to anyone up there. They didn't, even, they didn't even contemplate that beings could die. I don't think they even, that even fathomed. They didn't even cross their mind. And so they start to see this horrific thing. What's interesting, if you like pattern matching, you'll see that one-third of the sons listed in the Bible one-third rebelled. And this rebellion continued to spread. And what we see is that all existence ultimately became corrupted, right? And, and of this, only a very few remained faithful to God. One of the few was a man named Enoch. And Enoch was summoned to heaven. He was called to jury duty, and God brought him up in day one of the court case, 
Witness number one, Enoch. He was brought up to testify of the possibility of living in perfect harmony with God's will while evil was all around him, showcasing that God's government is just and is achievable for those who live by faith. We read in Hebrews 11.5 that by faith, Enoch was translated that he did not see death and was not found because God translated him for what? For before his translation, he had his testimony. He came to testify in the great court case above. That's why Enoch left. And this answers the question, why was Enoch translated? He was translated because he had jury duty. He had to go to heaven. And what's interesting is the, the popular, the court of popular opinion, right? The, the jury in heaven, they, you know, these unfallen angels see the complete corruption of what was happening on earth, and they're ready to conclude that God is just. But Lucifer argues it's not a good representation of the plans for his government. And so while the jury is ready to uh, side with God and, and reject this uh, court case, Lucifer says this is just one example. He says, this is not how my kingdom really looks. This is a fluke. He says, this is not a good ex- a, a example. And so the father, knowing that he does not want any question, this can only happen once. He never wants this to be questioned, says, okay, let's reset and see. And so during this period in time, right, no witnesses are called, but Noah begins preaching. And ultimately, the reset is prepared. And Noah preaches and, and, and warns the people down there, look, we've got to reset this environment because Lucifer says that he wants to see another example. So I have to clear this whole this, this environment out. We have to reset the environment. Please get on the boat. If the boat is big enough for anybody, get on the boat and you'll be saved. And you'll be, you'll be transported into the next environment and you'll be able to continue to live. But we know that, you know, and by the way, this answers the question of why was there a flood, which nobody in my, in my, in, you know, my 45 years of existence has ever been able to explain to me why there was a flood. And, and, and so ultimately this just becomes an, an answer of all the questions that I've been asking that no one's ever given me an answer to are all um, answered in this scenario. And so the, the Petri dish is reset. And there now, if you, if you, Watch the patterns. There's three new, three new people, right? What's interesting again is that one of the sons, 33%, again rebels. And from this lineage, we actually see the rebellion from Cush to Seba to Rama. This is, uh, if you go to my course on theism, you'll see that this actually forms the basis of Hinduism. And we also see that Nimrod, the grandson of Noah, great grandson, um, uh, he then creates the mystery religion. And this is where Zoroastrianism comes from, and this is where all other actually um, religions have spawned, um, pagan worship has spawned from this, and it also influenced ultimately Hinduism. So this guy, Nimrod, he doesn't believe it's God's promise that there'll never be a flood. And so he wants to create this tower that extends to the clouds, and that if another flood comes, he'll be untouchable. But ultimately what we see is we just start to see how quickly in this second iteration, in the second environment, how quickly all existence sees corruption and how Lucifer's plans are laid out one more time that how what his government looks like and only a few remain faithful to God and a few of these are called up to testify. Now Moses would be selected there in day three to testify about the fairness of God's law, the balance of justice and in mercy of his governance and the responsibilities that come with divine leadership. In this, we, we learn so much more about, about what's happening up there based on who is called. After this, we see that Elijah is now called up. And Elijah would be the selected as a witness to testify about the importance of true worship, about the certainty of God's judgments and the reward of faithfulness. And his life of translated, you know, is ultimately this translation re- reinforce the authority and justice of God's prophetic word. So Elijah is there to talk about the importance of making a choice. And now we're at the end of day four. And the jury says, we don't think we want God's, you know, Lucifer's judgment. God is just. God is just. We don't want Lucifer's government at all. And he then says, 
Well, God's law, it's not my fault. My government would be better, but God's law cannot be kept. And they ask, is this true? And so one more witness is now called. But this witness is actually not called to heaven. They're called down to earth. And moving at a thousand times speed, Christ then comes into earth, right? He experiences true education. And what he brought was the fourth ingredient to love. The final ingredient of love was revealed, and that was a demonstration, right? We reminded of the verse, there's no greater love than a man laying down his life for a friend. This is what Christ did. And after living a perfect life, keeping God's law exactly, he gave his life. And by shedding the blood of the Son of God, Lucifer had uprooted himself from the sympathies of heavenly beings. And the last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. The last link of sympathy between the jury and his court case was over. And so we see that there was then a number that was raised at Christ's res uh, crucifixion. And these brought varied testimonies throughout different circumstances. All the circumstances that Lucifer was saying, well, but what about in this situation? I don't think God's law could be kept. Or what about in this situation? Well, God raised a series of individuals that counteracted each of those allegations. So what we see here is that the witness list was about holiness in a law of warning, of law, of making a decision, and of redemptive power. And at the end of this, the jury said, we are ready to make our decision. And so what we see is that, you know, in the superior court, right, the special verdict form was handed out. This was filed in the heavenly court case, and the jury came back. Question one. We, you know, for we, the jury, answer the question submitted by the court as follows. Question one. Is the government of God, as established and maintained by the Most High, just and righteous in all its actions and decisions? The answer, we the jury find yes. Question two, can God's law be kept? Jury finds the answer, yes. And so the judgment is then issued. On this day, the jury composed of representatives from the heavenly host of the redeemed, after careful deliberation, review of all the testimonies and evidence presented, has reached a unanimous verdict. The jury finds that God's government is indeed just, righteous, and true in all ways. The charges brought against the government of God by Lucifer, alleging injustice and unfairness of the divine administration, are hereby dismissed. The authority and character of God are fully vindicated, and he is cleared of all charges." God is declared just. His government stands vindicated. We read here, however, there was a notice of appeal. Lucifer files a grounds of appeal on, files an appeal on the grounds that it is impossible of perfect obedience. And the appellant argues that it is inherently impossible for created beings with their propensities to fully and perfectly keep the law of God as required. By the way, this is also, this is also an accusation I hear from even church leadership, from people who say it is impossible, who've read too far into questions and doctrines. They say it's an unreasonable expectation. The requirement of God's law are, are deemed unreasonable and beyond the capacity of any created being to fulfill without error, thus rendering the law itself unjust and impractical. It's so interesting how so many who profess to be followers of Christ are actually making the same exact argument that Lucifer's making. And so this notice of appeal was then filed in the Supreme Court of the universe. Lucifer's charge that God's law was impossible to keep, was refuted by Jesus. And it was also refuted by Enoch and Elijah. But he said it's not enough. He said this is not enough people. And, 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 and the court says, well, what about the 12 disciples? That's not enough. What about the 12 disciples? What about the movement happening uh, during the Diocletian persecution? Right? When millions were willing to give up their lives, right? That's not enough, right? He says, what about 12 times 12 times 1,000? And this, this number was reached, right? This number was reached of a minimum, a literal minimum number needed to keep God's law. And so the agreement on an evidentiary con condition was then filed, right? In this, the evidentiary condition was the cessation of sin. The condition requires that a minimum of 144,000 individuals must completely cease from sinning and live in perfect obedience to God's law. 
And this must happen prior to the end of the cosmic week, so prior to the end of the 6,000 earth years. This would be a binding agreement. If the condition is met and the minimum of 144,000 individuals are achieved perfect obedience by the original verdict will be upheld and God's law will be confirmed as just and keepable by created beings. If the condition is not met, the appeal will be sustained and new judgment will be rendered, potentially altering the governance of at least our world here. And so God asks, would 144,000 people keeping my law be enough? And Lucifer says, fine, but I need one more thing. It can't be of those that already know you, because if you understand the time, this court case was going on. This court case was going on in the fifth day, and during this time, there were millions who were willing to keep God's law. But we saw this because there was how many were being killed in mass number through the Diocletian persecution. And so he asked for an amendment agreement on evidentiary condition. And the condition details were as follows. He says, The amend condition involves the cessation of sin by a minimum of 144,000 individuals after the completion of 42 prophetic months or 1,260 years. Do you know, have you heard about this time period, this 1,260 years of this 42 prophetic months? Have you ever had it actually explained to you? Has anyone actually ever told you what that time period was for? It's a time period that Satan has given control of the earth. We know that. But it's in order to eradicate the movement that was started by Jesus because he wanted the 144,000 to come out of complete darkness. They were not to come out of light. Do you not know that we are called out of darkness? And so this 1260 years is the same prophecy, prophetic time period spoken by Daniel 7, you know, Daniel 12, Revelation 11, 3, chapter, you know, it's all over. It's all the same time period, a time, time, dividing of times, 42 months, right? It's, it's, it's 1260 days. It's all the same time period. And it was a time that Lucifer was allowed to essentially have a flood of darkness, so when we think about the timeline, there was creation, right? So there's light. Um, you know, of this, this light then becomes darkened. The earth was reset with light, right? Out of the light, you know, out of the, the flood. And then there was darkness, but then the light, the earth was filled with light by Christ and the movement, the early Nazarene movement, the early Christian movement, apostolic church movement. The earth was filled with light and Lucifer did not want the 144,000 to come out of that movement because it had been too easy. And so it was agreed that he would be allowed to fill the earth with darkness. And what we see is we see this movement of the papacy, this movement of with, through Constantine of elevating paganism and Christianity together. And that's what created this, you know, ultimately what we understand as the Catholic Church today. And that then spawned out a Re Protestant Reformation, but it never actually took hold because it never kept the laws of God fully. They, they never embraced the Sabbath, and so they got pulled back in to papal, through ecumenicanism, right? They got pulled back in. And so they become apostate Protestantism. And all of this, right? this is what we're up against. And so we are here at the end of the 1260 years darkness, which was in 1798. We are now post that period of time. And now there is a call for a number God needs a final witness to prove that Satan's allegations are false. And so on the, on the court docket, on the witness list, there's one final request. Right? There needs to be a people. There, there needs to be a people who will stand without an intercessor. Will you accept this call? We're taken to this final scene. If we fast forward in time, Right? The prosecutor will still have his same allegation that God's law cannot be kept. And yet there will be a called onto the sea of glass a group of expert witnesses, hopefully millions, but there has to be at least 144,000. That was a green on number. And these witnesses will then testify. And God will, the same way God spoke about Job, God will speak about them. And when Lucifer makes his claim that God's law is impossible to keep, just like we read in Job 1.8, he'll say, have you considered my servants? In fact, we can replace a few words in this. 
And the Lord will say unto Satan, Have you considered my 144,000 servants, that there is none like them in the earth? They are perfect and upright, and those that fear God and have hate evil. Right? We need to understand what our role in this final time is. What is present truth to us? Present truth is the vindication of the Father. Fourth selected message is 319.3. It's the vindication of Right? When we look at Revelation 12, 11, and they overcame him, this is our mission. It's not to preach the gospel. The gospel will be preached. That was the last commission. The gospel will be preached as a byproduct. But that's not our primary focus. Our primary focus in this final generation, in this present time, our present truth, is to be those that can overcome the false allegations, to vindicate the Father. This can only be done with the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of our testimony, we have to be a witness. And we have to be willing to love not our lives, be willing to just the same way that those in the Diocletian persecution, those in the persecutions leading up before that, Neronian, etc., all those, they did not care about their lives. They only cared about vindicating the Father. And so we need to have a new mindset. And we need to understand what our role is. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are called to be a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him that called you out of darkness, out of the 1260 years of darkness and into his marvelous light.